because after all, they are my own people. You know, I'm my family are Muslims. Um, and I've given that, trying to, trying to explain the fact that I'm not this kind of creature with horns and a tail that's been painted. Um, there is actually very little in the satanic verses that hasn't been, in fact, quite commonplace discussion in the Muslim world for hundreds of years. Um, there may be ways in which it's done which have upset people, and as I say, I mean, that's, you know, I regret it, I'm sorry, but the point is it's there. And it is possible, I think, to increase that degree of understanding, and that's, you know, what I'd like to do. Meanwhile, the controversy that the Ayatollah unleashed has turned Rushdie's novel into a bestseller. Already reported 1.1 million hardcover sales, with the paperback yet to come. Well, so, so what, I'm supposed to be pleased. Um, I mean, it's, it's, um, I would very happily exchange my old level of sales and my old life for what you've just described as a success. But a writer who lives with Scotland Yard as his only companion does not have that choice. Your son, how old is he? He's 11. What do you tell your boy? Well, I, I try and tell him what's happening. You know? I mean, it's a, uh, it's a... Uh, and he must ask Dad, why do these people want to kill you? Mm. I think we're getting into an area here which I consider to be, you know, private matter between me and him. And um, I have tried, I mean, I have, you know, it's, it's at long distance, but I have tried to keep him informed as to what's going on. And I think it's, you know, that helps him, I hope, to handle it. And uh, Marianne Wiggins, your wife, is that over? Yes, that's over. What do you do for companionship? Do you have to live a celibate life? I mean, I, I, I hate to ask the question, but I'm sure everybody wants to know. Exactly. Um, it's nice to have a break. No, I'm not being serious. I mean, yes is the answer. What is your future? I don't know. I don't think in the long term at the moment. You know, my future is to go on writing books, I hope. And remarkably, in spite of all, Rushdie has just completed his first book from exile, a children's book for his son. Harun. Harun, yes. It's uh, a beautiful book. Well, I hope so. You know, it's, it's, no, uh, it's a beautiful book. There are three characters in this book that mm -hmm. I particularly enjoy, I mm -hmm. guess if that's the word. There is the engaging youngster, mm -hmm. who is your son. Well, there he is. There is you. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a storyteller. Yeah. That's the storyteller. Mm. That's Salman Rushdie. Mm. And there is the Prince of Silence. And by God, that is the Imam Khomeini. Well, I'd resist that reading completely. He is the Prince um. of Silence. And he tries to keep the storyteller from telling his story. That's right. Well, there's a, the, the, the book is a dramatization of all sorts of things. I mean, about it's a war between language and silence, mm -hmm. you know, which after all is an old literary project. Um, and it's a war between, between light and dark. So it's a fable about things quite other than Salman Rushdie and the Imam Khomeini. I confess, I opened Haroon, mm -hmm. a children's book, and suddenly discovered it's also an adult's book. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if the Imam had conceivably tamed you. He has not. I don't know. I mean, if, if I felt that I couldn't write as myself, I would stop writing. Because I, I value the art of writing too much to do it when I'm censoring myself. Um, if, if that had happened to me, I would put, my, to put down my pen and not write again. Um, I have to believe that it hasn't happened to me, that it's for other people to judge. Good luck. Thank you. Presenting the $9,500 Advantage. It comes with the Chrysler New Yorker 5th Avenue, which comes with a fuel-efficient 3.3-liter V6, a standard driver's airbag, better owner care than any Cadillac sedan, and a price tag $9,500 less than Cadillac Sedan DeVille. Chrysler 5th Avenue. Luxury with a $9,500 Advantage. Now get the added advantage of cash back or low APR financing on new 91 models. Did you know your small business should have AT&T Long Distance? What for? With MCI, I'm getting big savings. <laughs> but you could get AT&T quality. Who cares? I'm getting big savings. <laughs> but AT&T prices are extremely competitive. Competitive? Hey, I'm getting big savings. Okay. For that call from New York to Los Angeles, here's your big savings. Two cents? 
That's not big savings. Competitive price. Another AT&T advantage. I want to fly in business class. My company only pays for coach. So I fly business class for the price of coach. It's called beating the system. Of course, you can't do it on just any airline. Now till December 15th, when you buy an unrestricted domestic coach ticket on TWA, you can reserve a confirmed seat in our business class for the price of coach. You pay for coach, you sit in business class, and it isn't even your birthday. TWA's business class. We did it first, we do it better. A 20-year-old murder mystery. The man has been in prison for a crime he did not commit. Comes back to haunt Jessica. The real killer is getting frightened now. Murder, she wrote. Then, Jill Eikenberry. Bunny's kidnapped. And Michael Tucker. I'm just borrowing you. They're not practicing law, they're breaking it. The Secret Life of Archie's Wife, tonight. It's Halloween magic with blockbuster comedy. Learn to throw your voice, fool your friends, fun and party. Batman's Michael Keaton, Alec Baldwin, and Gina Davis star in Beetlejuice. It's your time. Tuesday. W.I.O.U. Wednesdays on CBS. Under normal circumstances, a murder committed four decades ago would hardly tweak our interest, except that the victim was our late colleague, CBS News correspondent George Polk, whose reporting from post-World War II Greece was so good that one of journalism's most prestigious awards has been named after him. Polk was one of Murrow's boys, who reported on CBS radio that the Greek government was awash in corruption and squandering millions of dollars in American aid. In the course of his reporting, Polk tried to make contact with the communist guerrilla leader, and that, said the Greek government, led to his murder. Did it? Not according to a new book called The Polk Conspiracy. This is George Polk reporting from Athens. Now back to CBS New York. On May 6, 1948, CBS correspondent George Polk signed off for the last time. Ten days later, 300 miles away in the northern Greek port of Salonika, a fisherman found his body floating in the bay. His arms and legs were bound with rope. There was a bullet hole in the back of his head. He'd been missing for one week. Over 40 years later, we came to Salonika to pick up the threads of this murder mystery a mystery that was first investigated immediately after Polk's death by CBS correspondent Winston Burdett. All the signs are that this was a very conspiratorial political assassination. It had been well planned every step in it. He believed that he was going uh, to meet the communists. He was either in their hands, they in bad faith, or he was in the hands of imposters uh, of the extreme right wing. And this was the great ambiguity of the crime in the early days of the investigation. In 1948, George Polk found himself here in Athens as the CBS News Middle East correspondent at the heart of a country in turmoil. President Harry Truman, in what would become known as the Truman Doctrine, had pledged all of America's resolve to help free people stop the spread of communism. And Greece, this ancient birthplace of democracy, had become the first battleground. The Greek government, backed by the United States, was fighting a civil war against communist guerrillas in the mountains. But the problem, as George Polk saw it, was that the government was in danger of losing the war through oppressive measures and corruption. When the American aid mission to Greece sent $400 million worth of food and supplies, Polk reported that most of it went straight into the pockets of right-wing politicians and their supporters. So his reporting was, was, was tough and was, was, was irritating both to Washington and to Athens. Conti Martin has recently written a book about the George Polk case. And some of the people that he was up against believed that the press particularly in the early days of the Cold War, was meant to be harnessed to America's official foreign policy and was really meant to serve that foreign policy. In May 1948, Polk flew alone to Salonika for a last look around before he went back to the States on a leave of absence. Salonika in those days was on the frontier of the Civil War in a place fraught with danger. I had a terrible premonition. I said to my maid, I, uh, I should go with him. I can't protect him always. But I'm afraid for this trip. I really am afraid. In Athens, Polk had married a young Greek woman, Rhea Kokonis. 
Did he say anything to put you at ease? Well, he says, I'm not going to stop any bullets. I don't worry about that. I just, uh, uh, I, I can't say no to life. I've got to live the way I know how to live, you know. In Salonika, Polk wanted to take one last shot at getting the biggest story of the day, an interview with communist leader General Marcos, whose guerrillas, feared by the government, were camped in the mountains across the bay. But to get to the guerrillas, he needed contacts, and in a government-controlled town, that was risky business. By the time George Polk returned to his hotel around 2 o'clock on the afternoon of that last day, he had made contact with someone he believed would lead him to the communists. Sometime during the afternoon, he wrote a letter to Ed Murrow, which Murrow later read on the air. George wrote, I've worked since December on getting to Marcos headquarters. Lots of persons have presented themselves to me, claiming to speak authoritatively, but I think they were all phonies. So, with a contact, through a contact, I'd like to get in touch with the persons who count. At around 7 o'clock that evening, George Polk went for drinks at the American consulate. It was the last place anyone would admit to seeing him alive. An hour later, he left here for a dinner engagement, but he didn't say with whom. After dinner, Polk was confident that he would now be taken to meet the persons who count. But in the dark streets of the Salonica waterfront, that contact he had made led him into a trap. George Polk never knew what hit him. He was shot just once in the back of the head with a long-barreled, high-velocity gun. The bullet which exited through his nose was never found. Then they tied his hands and his legs with rope, and shortly after midnight, unconscious but still alive, still breathing, George Polk was thrown into the dark waters of Salonica Bay. George Polk had that honesty and integrity the reverence for fact and indifference to criticism which gave him the respect of the men in his trade. Those of us who knew George and worked with him can never cease to be concerned about his murder. News of George Polk's death caused anger among his colleagues in the States. But which side had killed him, the right or the left? Major Nicholas Muscondis, chief of the Salonica police, told the Greek press that it could only have been the work of communists and that's whom they were looking for. Had the Greek communists ever threatened George? No, never. Had he been threatened at all? Yes, they were, there were anonymous phone calls calling him a communist and to get out of Greece or we're gonna kill you. 